Today is a great pleasure to welcome Michael Levin. He's a brilliant professor of biology. Um, he received in his PhD in genetics from Harvard University, and he's a distinguished professor in biology in at Tufts University in the Greater Boston area. And what's amazing is we are going to talk about cognition, conscious intelligence without a central nervous system how much consciousness and cognition we can describe in animals, uh, in our cells, without a central nervous system. And, and hopefully we'll talk a little bit about bioelectricity and its uh, influence you know, beyond genetics, without genetics, without a direct influence of the gene, how much is happening in an organism. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, it's good to be here. What I'm going to talk about today is... Uh what we understand by the intelligence of the cells in your body, the cellular collectives uh, that I think have a huge relevance for a new kind of regenerative medicine. And in particular, I will talk a little bit about how bioelectricity serves as a sort of cognitive glue that binds individual cells into this kind of collective intelligence. And then if you're interested in more of the details, all of the primary papers and, and many other resources are available here at this, uh, at this website. So um, the most uh, fundamental fact to remember is that all of us made this journey where we start life as a um, unfertilized oocyte. Uh, just a single cell that uh, is a you know kind of a chemical um, little bag of a bag of chemicals, and eventually through this amazing process of embryonic development, we become something like this, or maybe even something like this. So if we think that out here as humans we have high level second order metacognition, and we have uh, consciousness, and we have decision making, and memory, and preferences, and all these beautiful things, we have to ask ourselves where did that come from? Because we all start here. And this process is slow and gradual. There is no point in developmental biology that some sort of magic lightning flash converts you from physics to mind. So we have to understand that whatever cognitive capacities we have are the result of slow and gradual underlying biology that goes all the way back to here and even to the chemical networks inside. So we, we all make this journey and we have to understand um, where uh, where our bodies come from and, and that same process gener generates our mind as well. And so that's that's a kind of a, a, a sobering thought that uh, that we kind of, kind of come from from physics and chemistry. But at least, you know, uh, as we talk about ants and, and and termites and things like that as a, a collective intelligence, but at least we we are a unified intelligence, right? Like we all feel as if we are one central intelligence. We don't feel like a bag of cells. But of course, there are no unified really intelligences. Everything is made of parts. So Rene Descartes was really interested in the pineal gland because uh, he felt that that was the seat of the interaction with the soul because it was singular in the brain. It was one of the structures that was not duplicated. But if um, if he had had access to good microscopy, he would look into that uh, pineal gland and find out that, whoa, there isn't singular anything there. It's made up of, of a whole bunch of cells. And if he were to look inside of one of these cells, he would see this, this incredible uh, richness and complexity of stuff that's inside there. So we are we are collectives, uh, and the the whole uh, idea is to understand how the behaviors of these kind of things give rise to the behavior of that kind of a thing. And so here you see is uh, an example of what a single cell can do. This is a single cell organism known as a lacrimaria. So this little guy, you can see he's feeding um, on uh, bacteria in his environment. There's no brain, there's no nervous system. Everything that this organism needs to solve all of its metabolic, uh, physiological, um, morphological, and other needs is, is done with, with exactly one cell. So what we find out in biology is that we are a nested uh, set of nested dolls, not merely structurally, uh, but actually functionally. So, so from the collective to single organisms, to organs, to um, tissues and subcellular components, we are a set of uh, uh, multi-scale processes, each of which is a problem-solving agent, each of which solves problems in specific domains. Whereas individual animals will solve problems in the anatomical domains, their bodies will solve problems in the morphological domain. That's what I'll talk about uh, most. And then their various organs can do this in the physiological space and their cells and subcellular networks do this in, in gene expression space and in metabolic space. You can see here, this yellow thing right here is a, is a slime mold. Again, no brain, the whole thing is a single cell, even though it's quite large. 
And uh, these are glass discs. Here's one glass disc. Here are three glass discs. And so this is this is a, a, a project done by uh, Narosha Murugan in my lab a couple of years ago. And so what she found is that if you place that slime mold here, for the first few hours, it sort of grows all over the place, right? And you would think that it's just going to grow sort of evenly. But what it's actually doing, it turns out during this time, is gently continuously pulling on the substrate to feel the vibrations that come back. Specifically, it feels the strain angle and of the of the weight of these discs. Now, these discs are extremely tiny, so this weight is very small, but it can feel the difference between one and three. How do I know? Because if you do this assay, it will reliably grow towards the three. So during this time, what it's doing while it's out here is it's integrating all of that information and making a decision of where it's going to go. And somewhere around this point, the decision is made, boom, it knows where the heavier mass is. And you can play all kinds of games about stacking the, the, the discs one on top of the other and so on. But what it, what it understands is the strain angle of the big mass here. Now, uh, the, they are food for, for the, for the slime mold? No, no, there's no food. These are glass discs. These are, this is glass, completely inert glass. All it feels is mass. Now, why does it care about mass? I have no idea. Maybe, maybe in the forest, um, a big mass means something fell over and died and you can walk over and eat it. I really don't know. Uh, but it prefers the heavier mass. Yeah. Did you say they were feeding vibration? The, what it does is it, it generates the vibrations. It, it, it pulls on the medium. And as a result, it feels uh, how how it it's it's like sonar, right? You 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 make a disruption in the medium, and you feel what comes back to you, like that. So um, this is this is one example. Here's another interesting example. Amazing. This is this is a caterpillar. These these animals live in a two dimensional world of crawling around on leaves, and they have a brain suitable for doing that and for eating the leaves. They turn into this thing, which is a, a completely different kind of creature that lives in a three-dimensional world. It doesn't care about the leaves. It wants to drink nectar, and it has a different brain suitable for that task. To get from here to there, what happens, the brain is basically liquefied. It gets uh, taken apart into pieces. Most of the cells die. All the connections are broken. But the remarkable thing is that uh, if you train the caterpillar, the butterfly remembers the original information. So despite the brain being basically taken apart and put back together, the actual memory content remains. So if you think about the sort of philosophy 101 question of what's it like to be a butterfly, this is even worse. What's it like to be a caterpillar slowly becoming a butterfly, right? Not, not evolutionarily, during the lifetime of the creature itself, your brain is taken apart and rebuilt into a completely new kind of system with new preferences, new capabilities, but some of your old memories. And so to some extent, the uh, personality, um, the personal identity here has, has remained. What is the minimal part of the nervous system that is that is not liquefied? It doesn't liquefy absolutely everything. What's Good the... question. In this system, no, but in this system, everything. So look here. Yeah. Uh, this is this is a planarian. So mm -hmm. so you train this guy to recognize that these little bumpy discs have food on them. They will learn it eventually. Then you can cut off the head with has the brain. The tail sits there doing absolutely nothing for about ten days. During that time, it grows a head. After it grows back the new head, which is ne necessary to drive behavior, you find out that it remembers the original information. And so here, nothing needs to be left. Uh, somewhere, this information is somehow stored somewhere through the rest of the body and imprinted onto the new brain as the brain develops. So you see this, this kind of uh, merger of, of information, sort of behavioral information that you learn during your lifetime and morphological information that you need to have in order to build a complex head with brain, with eyes, with, with everything else. And what happens to the behavioral information while all of this is being rebuilt from scratch, completely gone in this case? Is that true that you can cut it up to 275 pieces, something like that? So you can have a few cells and you, they will be able to reproduce the whole animal. Yeah, it's it's more than a few cells. Uh, we don't know exactly what is the minimum number of cells, but it's more than a few. You need you need you need a minimum number for the piece to be able to um, undergo morphogenesis, but we don't know what that is. I mean, think about it this way, uh, in, uh, in human and in many other animals, the females are able to regenerate an entire body from one cell, right? So you can think of normal human reproduction as regeneration from one cell that the mother creates. The mother has one cell, the egg, that regenerates the whole organism. In fact, development, one way to think about development is as regeneration. So we're talking a lot of omnipotent stem cells. 
So you have enough piece of a tissue to get enough of those cells, or we don't know. Yeah, but but the bigger issue is that's like that's like saying, uh, you know, um, I, I I need a building, but don't worry, we have we have we have lots of bricks. Uh, yeah, you you need the cells, and that's good. But but also really critical is the information, yeah. uh, because because this whole thing has to put itself together. So it's not enough. You know, stem cell biology by itself does not solve this problem. Um, and that kind of plasticity is also seen in vertebrates. So here, for example, we create a, uh, a tadpole that has no primary eyes here. So these are the nostrils, the mouth, the brain, the gut, uh, no eyes. But we put some eye cells on its tail, and these cells have no problem to build uh, a nice eye, even though it's sitting in a bunch of muscle instead of uh, near the brain. And then we found out that these animals can see quite well. So we, we built a machine to test them in uh, visual learning assays, and we found out that they can see. So without a long period of evolutionary adaptation, uh, it, this this radically different uh, sensory motor architecture uh, is has, has uh, adaptive behavior. So that that plasticity is is a quite amazing. So the eyes develop fiber, nerve fibers to the spinal cord. That's correct. They yeah they develop they develop an optic nerve. The optic nerve sometimes goes to the spinal cord, sometimes to the gut. We've never seen it reach all the way to the brain. It just sort of hangs out in this in this area here, and that's sufficient to confer to confer vision. So we want to ask a very basic question that has to do with fundamental um, kind of cellular intelligence, which is where does the uh, anatomical order come from? We we start life as a collection of blastomeres. This is a cross section through a, um, a an adult a human torso. So you can see the amazing order. All of this stuff is in the right place relative to each other. Where does it come from? And I might be tempted to say DNA, but but we know how to read genomes now, and we know that. Uh, genomes don't directly encode for any of this. They encode for the tiny hardware that every cell gets to have. So the proteins, right? The signaling elements and, and the bioelectric elements that every cell gets to have. Then there's this process of physiology, which is basically the software that allows these cells to know what to make, when to stop. And as uh, workers in regenerative medicine, we would like to know how to communicate with these cells to tell them what to rebuild. We don't want to communicate with an individual cell. We want to communicate with a collective and say, build, build a limb, build an eye, build a, build a healthy organ, and, and that kind of thing. So well, pretty much every problem in medicine, with the exception of infectious disease, boils down to, uh, to, to, to this problem. Because if we were able to tell cells what they should be building, we could solve birth defects, we could regenerate after traumatic injury, we could reprogram cancer, we could prevent aging, degenerative disease, all of that, if we could communicate anatomical goals to cellular collectives. So we, we think, you know, for the future, you might imagine the end game of this, of this whole process is that if we had a, a computer kind of a platform where you sit down and you draw the plant or animal that you want, what it would do is compile that description into a set of uh, stimuli that would have to be given to cells to get them to build this particular thing. Notice that this is not a 3D printer. We're not trying to micromanage where the cells go. It's a communications device. It's a way to communicate anatomical goals to collections of cells. And so this, this we really, we really, uh, we, of course, we don't have anything like this. We are we're working towards it. And where science is today is that molecular medicine is very good at understanding which proteins and other uh, elements signal to which which other like how do they how do the molecules interact but we actually have a long way uh, from being able to control anatomy to 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 give someone back their their um, their limbs or something like that and i think that right now we are still in biomedicine we are still stuck where computer science was in the 40s and 50s because so what she's doing here in those days the way you program this computer you have to physically rewire it you have to interact with the hardware and all of uh, the modern um, uh, kind of biomedical, uh, the standard biomedical approaches are down at the hardware level. So manipulating uh, the, the genetic sequence via CRISPR and things like that, um, protein engineering, rewiring pathways, it's all focused on the hardware. And what we are still largely missing is a rigorous uh, framework for taking advantage of the higher level information processing of, of biological structure, which is AKA intelligence. What I mean by intelligence is uh, this definition of William James. I do not mean the kind of human second order kinds of things where you say, I know what I know and I know what my goals are, right? That's a very advanced property. I'm thinking of something much more fundamental. Uh, William James said that intelligence is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. That's it. 
some degree of getting to the same goal by different means and what level of competency or ingenuity you can muster towards getting to those goals, that's the degree of intelligence and it might be quite small or it might be quite advanced. So now the question becomes, okay, fine. Uh, do cellular swarms uh, deploy a significant degree of intelligence? And if so, what is it and how can we take advantage of it? Well, here's one simple thing. Uh, we know that that eggs reliably give rise to the correct target morphology. So, so if you have a if you have a human embryo, you get a standard human most of the time. Okay, so it's reliable, but it's not hardwired because if you take that early embryo and you cut it in half or even into quarters, you don't get half embryos. You get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. So, what that process has is not just the ability to 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 take the same path in anatomical space, moving from a single cell to a, to a human anatomy, but actually it has the ability to get there despite perturbations. So this idea that you can get to that same set of uh, anatomically correct states from different starting positions, and even despite some, some perturbations or some um, local maxima that, that might interfere with you if you are a, a very simplistic agent. This is also true for regeneration. So uh, this, this little guy is, a, is an axolotl. And uh, they regenerate their limbs, their jaws, their eyes, uh, portions of uh, their heart and um, their brain, uh, spinal cord, ovaries, um, highly regenerative. And what happens is that when they lose uh, particular uh, uh, portions of, uh, of the limb, the cells will regrow exactly what's needed, no more, no less, and get you back to the correct pattern. The most amazing part of this, of course, is that it actually knows when to stop. So, um, oh, and by the way, uh, this is not just for like uh, amphibia and planaria. Um, humans regenerate their liver. Uh, deer every year regenerate these large amounts of bone and and and, uh, and and innervation. Human children regenerate their fingertips up to up to a certain age. So, one of the most amazing uh, aspects of this cellular intelligence is that much like conventional brainy intelligence, it can use diverse. Uh, low-level um, kind of behaviors to achieve its goal. So here's a simple example. This is a cross-section of a kidney tubule uh, of a newt, and you can see that there's about eight to 10 cells that work together to make this thing. One thing you can do is you can force these cells to be much larger, and if you do that, uh, fewer of them will still give you the exact same shape. So that's interesting. They scale the number of cells to their size to get you the correct outcome. But the most amazing thing is that uh, if you make the cells truly gigantic, a single uh, a single cell will be uh, too too big to allow any others in. And so what it will do is it will uh, bend around itself and give you that same kind of lumen, right? So what's 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 cool about this is that this is a different molecular mechanism. This is cell to cell communication. This is cytoskeletal bending. So in the service of this high level goal of making this tubule, different molecular mechanisms are chosen. To call, called up as needed to get to get the job done, and so that that's a kind of top down causation that indicates the flexible problem solving. If you take a standard newt uh, and and you just without any kind of evolutionary adaptation, you just say, well, now your cells are are you know four times the size that they should be. It has these different ways of getting the job done, despite the fact that it can't trust how many cells it has, it can't trust what the size of the cells is. All of this is up for change, and the system has to adjust. They have a norm, there's a set point to reach. So this information must be recorded somewhere to be able to reach this this norm or this. Uh, so Correct. So I'm about to, yeah, I'm about to show it to you. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. So yeah, so 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 this is uh, this is um, a, a similar a similar idea that we discovered a few years ago, where uh, if where you have these tadpoles and uh, the tadpoles uh, have to become a frog and they rearrange their face. So the eyes have to move forward, the jaws have to come out, there's all kinds of rearrangements. So it used to be thought that this was a hardwired process. Every organ moves in a particular way and then you go from a normal tadpole to a normal frog. So we decided to test the level of intelligence of that process. And so what we created was these Picasso tadpoles. Everything is in the wrong place. The, the jaws are off to the side, the eyes on top of the head, everything is scrambled around. And what we see is that these animals also make pretty normal frogs because all of these organs move from their new positions in ways that they need to move to get to where they're going, and then they stop. So what the genetics gives you is not a hardwired system that does the same thing every time. It actually gives you a clever little problem-solving machine that minimizes error relative to the target morphology. So now, as you just asked, uh, okay, if you're going to have a homeostatic process like this and minimize error, you have to store the set point. You have to know what the correct pattern is. 
how is that done? And this is this is different than the standard way of thinking about this, which is through emergence and complexity, the idea that if you have lots of local rules, eventually something complex can happen. And this is quite different from that. This is this is uh, context sensitive behavior to to reduce error relative to a stored target. So how does this work? Well, we started looking for this and uh, we took as our inspiration the brain. Because in the brain, of course, this is uh, the kind of uh, main aspect of behavior is that animals with specific goals can execute different types of uh, behaviors to get to that goal. So how does it work? So in the brain, um, what you have is you have this hardware, which are a bunch of electrically active cells using these ion channels to acquire electrical potential, and they connect electrically to uh, their neighbors. And there's the, thus there's a network, and that network can compute using these electrical signals as uh, information carriers. And so that's the hardware. The software is here. This is this is a zebrafish brain, and you're seeing all this electrical activity uh, in a living brain. And uh, there's this idea of neural decoding. So the neuroscientists are, are saying that if we could only decode the, uh, this 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 physiology, this electric activity, we could then know what the what the what memories, what um, uh, preferences, what goals, uh, behavioral repertoires, what what all, all of the inner mental life of this animal, we could decode that if we had. And of course, they, they're doing this with with humans as well. Uh, that's the commitment: is that all of that cognitive content is in the physiology, and when we need to decode that. So the amazing thing is that this is not just for brains. Every cell in your body has ion channels. Most of them have electrical uh, uh, connections to their neighbors. And so there are these networks. These networks are extremely ancient, long. They were here long before brains and neurons evolved. And we have been doing the exact same kind of neural decoding um, project to try to understand in, in the same way that electricity allows the individual neurons in your brain to bind together towards a large scale intelligence. We're trying to understand how the electrical activity of non neural cells binds together to give them a kind of goal-directed behavior in anatomical space as opposed to three-dimensional space. So what we've developed is a technique. This is a voltage-sensitive fluorescent dye. So this is a compound that gives you a, a kind of um, light-based readout of all the electrical conversations that these cells are having with each other. This is an early frog embryo uh, 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 in time-lapse development. <clears throat> we tie this to the molecular biology of which channels and pumps are expressed where. The patterns that we can read out from this. So, so, so here, if you wanted to to see the 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 pattern, here are a couple of examples. Here's one. So, this is a video of um, the early frog embryo putting its face together. And so, what you will see is, uh, of course, it's sped up. There's all kinds of stuff going on. But this is one frame out of that uh, out of that video. And you can see that here's where the here's the memory of of the tissue of what a correct face looks like. Here's where the eye should be. Here's where the mouth should be. Here's where the lateral placodes should be. This is the pattern. And if you change this pattern, then everything downstream will change. And I'll show you that in a minute. This is instructive for how to make a frog face. And this is a pathological pattern. So here's an oncogene that's been injected into a frog embryo. Uh, that oncogene will eventually cause a tumor that metastasizes. But before that, you will be able to see, by, by using this electrical imaging, that already these cells have disconnected from their neighbors. As far as they're concerned, they're now back to being an amoeba, and the rest of the body is just envi external environment as far as they're concerned. So that's where you get uh, metastasis. They're just amoebas uh, doing what uh, what amoebas do at that point. So, so this is how we track these kind of patterns. Now, more important than that is the functional uh, tools. We do not use any applied there's no there's no magnets there's no electrodes there are no frequencies no waves no radiation what we do is exactly what neuroscientists do which is to control the native interface that these cells have for programming each other that interface are the ion channels on their surface and uh the the um, electrical synapses that they use to communicate from each other so we can use drugs we can use light we can use a variety of techniques to open and close these channels and that changes the electrical pattern in the whole tissue, allowing us to say, uh, to test our hypotheses about what do the different patterns mean. That's exactly um, how people uh, like, like uh, Tanagawa at MIT incept false memories into mice by using optogenetics, using light to put new, uh, uh, new electrical patterns into their brains to give them memories of things that never happened. We are trying to put new bioelectric patterns into tissue to give it new I, new. Um, uh, new pattern memories of what to build in morphogenesis. And when you do that, uh, when you manipulate their their pattern memory, you can make them build new brains, like extra extra brains, 
uh, extra legs. Right? Here's our six-legged frog. Uh, you can make hearts. You can make uh, otocysts or inner ear organs, or you can make fins. This is especially weird because the tadpoles aren't supposed to have fins. This is more of a fish kind of thing. So you can give them some hallucinations about uh, building things that uh, that they normally don't even build. And here's one very specific example that illustrates the kind of um, taking advantage of the native intelligence. We took I, sh I, I showed you that electric face pattern, and there was one specific pattern that little eye eye spot that that uh, I told you controls where the eye goes. So uh, what we did was we took some uh, ion channel RNA and we injected it into cells that are going to become gut here, and we said, could we establish the same bioelectrical state that normally controls where the eye goes? And sure enough, if you do that here, these cells obey and they go ahead and make an eye. These eyes have the same complex inner structure of lens, retina, all that stuff. But the amazing thing is that we didn't give enough information to tell you how to make an eye. All we provide is a little bit of a trigger that says build an eye here. If it, It's like a subroutine call in programming where all we provide is, a, is, a, is, a, is, that, is that trigger. That trigger doesn't say what to do with stem cells. It doesn't say what kind of cell anybody should become. It specifies organ level information, build an eye here. Not only that, here's, here's another super, super uh, cool uh, aspect, which is that if we inject this potassium channel into these cells, you can see that they're blue. Th th this whole thing is a lens sitting out in the middle of a tail somewhere. You will see there's not enough of them to make a nice lens, but what they do is they recruit their neighbors right, to participate in that process. So this is a secondary uh, instruction. We instructed these cells, hey, make an eye. They realize there's not enough of them, so they recruit enough of their buddies to complete this project, much like you will see in other collective intelligences like ants, where, where they will recruit as needed from the colony to, to get some sort of um, job um, accomplished. So from the perspective of regenerative medicine, this is great, because it means that in order to make a complex structure, you don't have to provide all the information of how to do it. In fact, we don't know how, how to do all the details. You don't need to. The system knows how to do it. And you don't even have to worry about size control because if you don't get enough cells, no problem. The system will, will scale itself to the appropriate task. And so for this reason, we're able to do things like this. This is our regenerative medicine project where if you have a frog, frogs, unlike salamanders, don't regenerate their legs. Um, if you uh, if you if a frog loses a leg, normally it doesn't grow back. Nothing happens. But we came up with a bioelectric cocktail of drugs, which specifically says to those cells, you need to not scar, but rather build a leg. And then uh, you can see here the pro regenerative genes are turned on and the leg immediately starts to grow by 45 days. You've got some toes, you've got a toenail and eventually a very nice leg that is sensitive to touch and it's motile. It can move. The animal can can use it. This this kind of in this kind of project. The um, the bioelectric uh, uh, stimulus, meaning meaning the ion channel drugs that are sitting on the wound, are present for 24 hours. The leg then grows for a year and a half. Uh, um, 18 months of leg growth because we're not trying to micromanage it. It's that very early decision point of scarring versus versus growth that we're trying to manipulate. And I have to do a disclosure here because. Um, uh, Dave Kaplan and I are scientific co-founders of this company called Morphoceuticals Inc., where we are now uh, trying this in, in in mammals and eventually, hopefully, in human patients. Um, and uh, so that's so that's that's how the bioelectricity is being transitioned to regenerative medicine for. Uh, and, and then, by the way, there's nothing limb specific about this. This should be workable for most body organs. It's just uh, the limb is where we decided to um, to start. This is also true for. Uh, you can also use this to repair birth defects. So this is what a standard tadpole brain looks like. So forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. And um, the kind of uh, path going forward for us is, uh, is, is, is this, where, where what we're doing is we have, our, and, and you can play with this a little bit, the software is, is starting to come, come online. Uh, when you know what the correct and the incorrect bioelectric patterns are, you can have a simulator that will try to determine which channels and pumps can be targeted. And then of course we know what uh, what drugs exist to target those channels, and and this this is this is a sim system for uh, uh, picking electroceuticals that that will communicate uh, morphological goals to the to the tissues. We looked at limb regeneration. We looked at birth defects. I want to show you a uh, cancer, a quick uh, cancer application. This is uh, this is of course our single cell, and what evolution has done is enabled 
individual single cells, which are very good at caring about tiny little cell level goals, such as metabolic state, enables them to join into networks such that the network is able to care about much bigger goals, such as building a correct limb. This is because networks can remember much larger patterns and they can operate in spaces that single cells can't operate in. But that electrical process uh, that allows networks to, to have these grandiose kinds of goals can break down. And when it breaks down, that's when 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 uh, cancer appears. So this is this is these are human glioblastoma cells. Uh, they're not any more selfish than than any other cell. There's just their cells are smaller. So what's happened is that the computational boundary of the biggest goal you can imagine. So for for this collective, it's like this whole giant limb that now has shrunk down to the size of a single cell. And so all it has is single cell level goals. Uh, reproduce as much as you want. To go as go wherever life is good, and so on. So it's back to their back to their ancient unicellular self. So having this kind of weird way of thinking about this, thinking about cancer as a disorder of uh, a cognitive boundary, we decided to try a therapeutic, which would reinflate that boundary. So what we do is we we inject an oncogene, a human oncogene, um, all kinds of nasty ones, uh, KRAS mutations and so on. And normally it makes a tumor, right? So, so here it is. And so when you inject this oncogene and it's labeled with red, so you can see it's actually all over the place here. What we do is we co-inject an ion channel that forces, it, it doesn't kill the cells and it doesn't uh, do anything to the oncogene. What it does is forces those cells to remain connected electrically to this big network that keeps them all harnessed towards building nice organs. And when you do that, uh, there, even though the oncogene is still there and the cells are still there, there's no tumor. This is the same animal. There's no, there's no tumor. Because what you've done is you've reinflated the uh, the computational uh, uh, kind of a cognitive light cone of these cells, so that now their goals are uh, these these morphogenetic um, traversals of of anatomical space. Okay, so the last thing I, I want to show you is is this. So far, so far, I've shown you that in the context of of birth defects, of regeneration, and cancer, what we have is the ability of cells to pursue specific anatomical goal states, meaning that they can traverse that that anatomical space to reach the right uh, shapes. And that's that's very convenient for regenerative medicine. But you might ask, where do these shapes come from in the first place, right? And so so typically the answer is, well, evolution. So so what evolution does is it makes sure that uh, the, the, the embryo contains by default an electrical memory of the right thing that it's supposed to make, okay? And that's true. That's normally, that is what happens. But we decided to test uh, every, you know, all good intelligences can uh, potentially store multiple um, multiple different uh, goals. They don't, they, you know, they don't, they're not all stuck always on the same one. So we asked a simple question, and so this is this is a project uh, that we're doing with uh, Joshua Bongard's lab, um, who's a collaborator of ours at the, this, uh, the co-founder, in fact, of this uh, institute here. And uh, and we have to do a disclosure because he and I um, have this have this company, Fauna Systems. Um, we asked a simple question, which is, if you liberate cells from the organism. Will they reboot their their multicellularity? What will they make uh, if if you give them a second a second chance in a different environment? And so all the biology here was done by uh, Douglas Blackiston um, in my group. And uh, here's uh, here's what he did. Uh, this is an early frog embryo at this stage of about a thousand cells. Uh, you can take off these uh, these skin cells. They're they're fated to be skin. Uh, you take them away from everything else. Notice we don't add anything. We aren't adding new genes. We aren't putting in some weird nanomaterial. The only way we're uh, manipulating these cells is we're removing all this other stuff that normally tells them what to do. What does it tell them? It tells them to have a boring two-dimensional life uh, on the outside of the organism, keeping out the bacteria. And so so you tend to think that, well, then that's all these cells can do. That's what evolution has, has given them. But um, what he did was he dissociated these cells Put them in this little uh, uh, here. Put the, put them into this little little pile, and overnight, what you find out now they could do a number of things. They could die. They could spread out for go away from each other. They could become a flat monolayer. Um, there's many things, many things they could do. What they actually do is they make this interesting little ball that we call a xenobot for Xenopus lavis. That's the name of the frog, and then it's a biobot. Here's why: it moves on its own. It uses little hairs that are normally used to redistribute mucus on the side of the frog. It uses them to swim. And it can go in circles. It can sort of patrol back and forth like this. It can have these collective uh, behaviors. Here's here's a Xenobot doing a maze. So it swims over here. It uh, takes a corner without having to bump into anything. And then autonomously, it, it, it 
for some reason turns around and goes back where it came from. Remember, this is just skin. There's no brain here. It's uh, there's no nerves. Uh, there's no brain. Uh, this is just skin. This is this is what skin is up to when it's not uh, being behavior shaped by the other cells that make it do what skin normally does. So you can see the latent uh, intelligence um, in these cells, the the plasticity, the ability to do multiple things. In fact, one of the craziest things it does is because these guys can't reproduce the way frogs normally reproduce. If you give them loose skin cells out here, what they will do is uh, they will collect the cells into little balls and polish these little balls like this. And then because they're working with an agential material, these skin cells, the little balls themselves mature into xenobots. And guess what they do? They run around and do the same thing, repeating the cycle. So you have multiple generations of xenobots creating more xenobots out of materials they find in their environment. So evolutionarily, you can ask, uh, what does the frog genome actually encode? And you might think that, well, it encodes a standard set of developmental stages and then you know tadpole behavior. But actually what it really encodes is uh, a, a, an, a, an amazingly flexible uh, problem-solving machine, which in a different environment can do a, something completely different with different behaviors, a different developmental sequence and, and, and different behaviors. We actually don't know what they're um, cognitive properties are yet. We're studying that now. Can they learn? Can they be, what preferences do they have? Can they be trained? All, all of that stuff. So I'm just going to close um, here by um, kind of talking about the big picture, which is that, uh, you know, if you think about the space of all possible biomedical interventions, there are really two major categories. There are the ones that are bottom up. This is what all of traditional medicine is, is currently focused on, which are things like this that directly see, uh, directly seek to uh, to target the the symptom or the the the, the mechanism that you're trying to um, you're trying to impact, the top down kinds of approaches are more communication and signaling to try to take advantage of the complexity of the system so that you don't need to micromanage it and so that you can get to complex outcomes that we have no idea how to micromanage. So this because so so the the the, whole, the large class of morphoceuticals which are uh, uh, signals that that uh, try to get the uh, the cells to achieve particular shapes includes biomechanical triggers, some biochemical biochem signals, and of course, the electroceuticals that we talked about here. But there are also all kinds of approaches on behavior shaping. We can we, we, we found evidence of, uh, and, and others have too, of memory and learning in chemical pathways. We think it's possible to train cells, and, it's, and we're in the, at the moment uh, 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 playing with uh, training uh, whole tissues with rewards and punishments for specific behaviors, not trying to micromanage it uh, at the molecular level, but actually by teaching the, the tissue what to do. And you can see there are some papers um, here, here, and here that look at drug drug design and uh, and drug treatments in a, in, a, in a completely different way. So I'll just stop here by uh, thanking the uh, postdocs and students who did the work, um, our uh, funders for all this stuff, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, again, the two uh, disclosures and uh, the actual model systems that uh, teach us uh, everything, uh, everything that there is to know. So um, thank you. Thank you, Michael. It's really, really, really interesting. So the xenobots made of ectoderm, I assume, yep. you, how long do they live? Do they create a digestive system? And there were two big, there's neuro ectoderm. Do you have some special cells that begin to do a nervous system? Or... Uh, good, yeah, good, good question. Uh, they, they do not acquire any other cell types. Um, so they do not acquire a nervous system. They, uh, they don't eat, they don't have a digestive system by default. They live about a week, um, but on their own sort of maternal yolk supplies, but you can, um, you can feed them with, by putting nutrients into the water. And if you put nutrients into the water, the cells sort of soak it up. And our record, I think, is about 85 days. I think we've, we were able to keep them alive for about 85 days. And I think they can go longer. It's just uh, the trouble is the, the when you put nutrients into the medium, it tends to get infected because the bacteria love to eat that stuff. And this is, this is frog skin after all, and it's got a huge microbiome and the bacteria kind of go crazy. So we're, we're playing with that right now in terms of antibiotics. But I have a feeling that they actually can have a much longer lifespan if you keep feeding them. So the answer to where is the memory for the morphogenetic field, the, the field, the shape. So you, you talk about the bioelectric, there's a blueprint, a bioelectric blueprint, but I cannot imagine that is just kept in different voltage gated ion channels. That's, that's where the memory is kept. The, mem the memory is kept uh, in the electrical pattern 
that's established by the circuits within each cell. So let's let so so the parallel. Uh, let let's think about uh, parallel um, analogies. Uh, if you if you look at your uh, if you look at your computer memory, right? Where is the memory kept? It's not specifically in the transistors. There's nothing. The transistors don't change when the memory comes and goes. And if you wipe them, the transistors stay the same. The memory is the electrical pattern that exists across multiple. It's not in any one transistor. It's in multiple transistors. Same thing about in the brain. If you say, where is the memory in the brain? I mean, we actually don't know. But but the standard theory is that the encoding of the of your cognitive state is the electrical pattern across large regions of your brain. There's no one neuron that keeps it. There's no gene that keeps it. It's the electrical pattern. And what makes the electrical pattern? It's the ion channels opening and closing. So we have to get beyond this idea that uh, these kind of patterns are written down somewhere. It's a, it's a dynamical system state that is em embodied in, in this case, and like in the brain, in the electric uh, gradients. So, and it's passed on. So in the case of the planaria, you can have a small amount of cells. And I remember you also, you have an experiment when you 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 stimulate one part of the planaria to create a second head on the other side. And that planaria with two heads, one on each side, multiply, divide, have babies, and they all have two heads the, because you change the electric field. Well, so so let so let's be clear. Uh, they don't they don't have babies. What we do is we take the two we take the two headed uh, planaria and we cut them into pieces, and th those pieces also create two headed planaria. I I don't know that I I have never claimed that this kind of information would go through the sperm and egg, right? We we actually don't know. Uh, we we don't know that, but but we do know that if you cut them into pieces, the the memory has been permanently changed. And you can see it. We have a visual using this voltage dye. You can look at a planaria and you can say, you can read the mind of this morphogenetic intelligence. And you can say, how many heads do you think you should make if I cut you? And you can see it will, it will be one or two. You can, you can see it immediately from the pattern. And this memory cap is kept even with a small amount of tissue. Yeah, but not single cell. It's, 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 it can be a fairly small amount of tissue, but I don't know exactly what is the minimum, but I don't think it's a single cell. Right. And what stopped us from regenerating more like a salamander or, or a planaria flat? Yeah, well, it's a good question. If I, if I knew the answer to this, uh, our morphoceuticals company would be much uh, for, <laughs> further along. Uh, but I'll give, you, I'll give you some suggestions. Um, one thing is that uh, most good regenerators are aquatic. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. In dry air, it's very hard to uh, drive the kind of ion currents that you need to establish the right voltage state in the wound. So that's that's one issue. This is why when we are doing this in mice, we have a we have a wearable bioreactor that uh, fits on to give an aqueous aqueous environment. The second thing is that um, think about think about it from an evolutionary perspective. Let's say uh, we were some kind of um, uh, our ancestors, some kind of mouse-like uh, creature, you know, uh, running around the forest. Somebody bites your leg off. Unlike a salamander that can sort of float in in water, you're never going to get a chance to regenerate it. First of all, you'll get you're going to get infected. You are going to put weight on that leg and immediately grind those delicate cells into the forest floor. It's much better to scar, seal it off, and just you know hope hope you live through the experience. So I think I think what uh, you know the tradition the the transition to a, a mammalian lifestyle has uh, basically done away with uh, with with trying to regenerate in favor of scarring and, and minimizing infection and things like that. So we think that if we, A, protect the wound with a bioreactor and B, give it the right signals to, get to, to that it's safe to regenerate and then you should keep going, we think that will work. And that's we, we did it in frog and so we're now doing trying this in mammals. But do we have good regeneration properties in cartilaginous fish or osseous fish also? Fish, yeah, fish, fish do it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Zebra fish, yeah, pe plenty, yeah, plenty of pe people study regeneration in zebra fish. Sure, yeah, it's not only the aqueous thing. So, so think about the mammals. Um, the 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 best example of regeneration in mammal is the uh, the deer, and uh, the deer. One interesting thing about the deer antlers is you don't put weight on it. The, the deer doesn't it doesn't try to step on it. So I think that uh, it's a combination. You know, aqueous is one thing, but needing to support body weight is something else as well. So we can expect our ear to regenerate 
faster than our legs. And there are, and so rabbits regenerate holes in their ears. So you can you can punch holes in rabbit ears, and they and they regenerate them. And some some kinds of mice do too. Most mice don't, but there's there's a kind of mice that do. Yes, yes, yes. So do we have a very difficult question? A clear definition of cognition, consciousness, intelligence. Yeah, I mean, people argue about this all the time. So there are many different definitions, and I'm not suggesting that mine is the only one. But I, I, I have, I like the one that I gave in in this talk, which is William James's definition, which is a degree of of competency in getting to the same goal by different means, and that's a cybernetic definition. It doesn't say anything about brains. It doesn't say anything about whether you're evolved or designed or some some hybrid of the two. What it says is uh, your intelligence is really equal to your ability to, uh, to 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 get to your goals when you're perturbed in various ways. How clever are you? Um, I think that's really a necessary and and um, uh, it's a view of intelligence that uh, facilitates new experiments and new approaches. And if you stick to traditional definitions, which say, well, what does your brain look like? Then you miss then you miss a huge amount of intelligent behavior in things that don't have a brain. Right. Now, are we trying to extend the uh, definition of the nervous system or what's a neuron? Because all those cells are bioelectric and are we? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so so all of this is relative to a uh, a context, right? So so if you're in a uh, if you're in an a, a, in a neuroanatomy class, no nobody wants to hear me say what's a neuron. We don't know what a neuron because everybody knows what a neuron looks like. Okay, fine. But more broadly, if we're talking about evolution or regenerative medicine or something else, absolutely, it's very important to ask what a neuron is because you know, for example, a lot of electrophysiology work was done in bacteria. Right, um, and and many, in fact, most cells do most of the things that neurons do. Or they have the same machinery, of neurotransmitters, the serotonin, all over our bodies. Uh, it's actually not at all obvious what a neuron is. And so, so in those contexts, that makes a lot of sense. That, that question makes a lot of sense. You mean, but you would like to extend the definition of neuron even in in a, in a human, or what's the nervous system? Well, it depends. It depends. You see, all of these definitions are relative to their. I, I don't believe in absolute definitions. They they depend on what you're. What are you using that word for? So, if you're an if you're a neuroanatomist who is studying Parkinson's disease, you have a pretty good definition of a neuron, and you can stay with that definition. And I don't have any problems with that because for what you're trying to achieve, you need a very narrow, specific definition of what a neuron is. If, on the other hand, you are a neuroscientist and you say, wow, I have these amazing tools in neuroscience. I have conceptual tools like active inference and perceptual control theory. And, and, and I have this, the optogenetics and all this amazing stuff. I wonder what I can apply it to. In that case, I would say, yeah, neurons is not just the stuff in, in your nervous system. You can have, all those tools work everywhere in the body. So, so it's, it's um, uh, uh, a, a facilitating uh, kind of a pro pro uh, uh, progress way to think about this, that, that uh, there are, um, uh, other things that match that criteria that you can use these tools in. So when you think about it, we have memory encoded in these bioelectric fields at different level. And now you have also for some animal a brain. So we are talking about different types of memory doing different things. Yeah, yeah. What I think what I think evolution has done is it started out using these voltage gradients to process spatial information at a very slow rate, you know, relatively speaking. And but then when 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 neurons and uh, brains develop, basically that corresponds to evolution reusing those same tricks to handle temporal information, signals in time, and at a much faster rate, at millisecond uh, type of rates. So you take the or you take all the tricks that you had for navigating anatomical space, and you now deploy them to solve problems in a different space because evolution doesn't care what space you're solving. If it's got the you, you know tools that it can reuse, it will it will do that. But don't you have, you know, you, you know this experiment when you have a slime mole trying to train that a slime mole is only about space at that level? It's only space. We're talking, there's no temporal information. Uh, no, no, it's it, it's true that uh, that uh, slime moles can do things like uh, anticipation of temporal stimuli right. for, for, for sure. Yeah, I was I was referring specifically to bioelectrics. I don't, I don't know that the slime mold has anything to do with bioelectrics, uh, the, mem the memory of it. Um, slime mold memory, I have no idea what... Uh, uh, we have what 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 it, what it what it implements it so it may not be bioelectric. Okay, great. Wow, thank you so much. It's very brilliant what you are doing, and I'm so glad we had this discussion. 
I know you Thank have. Thank you so much. Yes, I hope we'll continue and we'll continue to follow you on uh, on all the articles you're writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the nice conversation.